Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School lesson for Sunday, August 7th, 2022. This is Deacon Barry Taylor, and we are beginning a new unit, uh, Unit 3, which is entitled The Great Hope of the Saints. We're in Lesson 10, and from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly, our lesson title is No More Tears. Devotional reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 32 verses 9 to 20. Our background scripture, which is also our lesson text, is taken from Revelations 21 verses 1 to 9. Our key verse from the King James Version is, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And that is Revelations chapter 21 and verse 4. Before we give a little background on our lesson, let's go before the throne. Our Father, we do thank and praise you, Lord, for all that you've done what you are doing and what you promise to do, Lord, even throughout eternity, Lord, where you have prepared a glorious home for us with you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word, and we pray, Lord, that we will understand it exactly as you intend for us to understand it, Lord. The promise, Lord, uh, the confident expectation that you're giving us, Lord, of the perfect place with you, that we can look forward to, Lord, if we place our trust in you and if we're steadfast, Lord, in believing in you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done again, what you're doing, what you've promised to do. And Lord, as we always, as we study your word, Lord, increase our faith, Lord, our steadfast belief and increase our obedience to your word and will. Lord, help us to, uh, to not sit back on our laurels, Lord, uh, waiting for uh, the day when you will call us home to glory but to be busy, Lord, doing good and, and, and glorifying you in this sin-sick and dying world. We thank you and we praise you again in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to say a little bit about this uh, book that we are that our lesson is taken from, Revelation. Not Revelations with an S, but Revelation. And it is the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this book, um, can be a very difficult book to understand uh, as many of you probably know if you've read it uh, it uses a lot of apocalyptic language uh, it uses a lot of uh, uh, hyperbolic language and symbols which can be difficult to understand uh, and the word revelation means uh, a pop it really comes from a word that means apocalyptic, which means to uncover or to reveal or to explain something that is, is hidden or uncover something that is hidden. And that is what uh, the Lord Jesus does beginning uh, at the very first chapter when he reveals himself and his glory to John, the apostle John, who was on the Isle of Patmos. Uh, he has been... Uh, uh, exiled there perhaps because of some teaching of the gospel uh, he is an old man uh, it is uh, believed that uh, this book was written around somewhere between 90 and 95 uh, AD 90 and 96 AD I should say around 96 AD and he is the last uh, of the apostles uh, that Jesus called to continue the work that he left for them to do and as you know it begins with uh, the Lord Jesus uh, giving John messages to write for the seven churches that are in Asia Minor uh, he, uh, he uh, commends them where appropriate and he warns them and condemns them where appropriate uh, and uh, and then he let, let me let me back up just a little bit and, and explain how this book the major divisions of Revelation, and then we'll go forward. So it, it really can uh, be divided into three major sections. Uh, the first uh, begins in chapter 1, uh, and it 
speaks of the things which are. The Lord Jesus tells John that he is going to uh, show him the things which are, and that's what's going on in those seven churches. Uh, and that's covered again in chapter 1. Chapters 2 and 3 cover the second division, the things which will take place. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, let me back up. First division, the things which Christ had seen in the churches. The things which Christ had seen in the churches. The second, again, is the things which are occurring now. And that's covered between chapters 2 and 3. And then the things which will take place. The things which will take place in the future. And that's covered between chapters 4 and 22. Our lesson is taken from the third division, the things in which will take place, in fact, second to the last chapter of Revelation. What has happened at before uh, our, our chapter, before chapter 21, is uh, the, all the uh, saints have been, have been called, uh, the Old Testament saints, as well as those who lived through the millennium, the millennium has occurred. Uh, the uh, Satan, the beast, and the dragon have been uh, brought out of the uh, the the, uh, the pit, the bottomless pit. Uh, they've uh, tried to war against the Lord's people, and of course, they have been destroyed and cast into the lake of fire, which burns forever and ever. Now, those who have died in sin are still in the grave. They have not been resurrected. Uh, the saints have been resurrected. Uh, and they are uh, about to enter into this city, this new glorious Jerusalem, which the Lord has prepared for them. If we go back to John 14 and 2, verse 2, John tells his disciples who became apostles in the upper room that he is going to prepare a place for them and this is the place this new Jerusalem is the place that God has prepared for them he said in, in my father's house are many mansions and I go there to prepare a place for you and just to, uh, to, to again put us uh, in the context of uh, these last chapters of Revelation I'm going to back up uh, to chapter 20 and read very quickly between verses 11 and 15 and this is speaking about the great white throne judgment which we do not want to appear before and it says then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away and there was found no place for them that's the heaven and the earth and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and, the dead, and, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his work. So the, those who died uh, apart from Christ, not having believed in Christ and what he did on the cross for them, or being resurrected from all places in the earth at this point after the thousand year reign of Christ on earth. And then it says, Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Okay, so they died once physically, and now they're about to die spiritually, and that meaning to be eternally separated from Christ and from the Father. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That along with the dragon, along with Satan. And uh, so that immediately precedes our lesson text again which begins verse 1 of chapter 21. Now before we get into uh, uh, reading our verses and having some verse by verse discussion uh, let's take a, uh, a 
a broad view of what our objective is. Our objective is to understand what is being said, clearly what is being said, to get over any translation or cultural barriers that prevent us from clearly understanding what's being said here. Uh, and, and its importance, of course, the Lord uh, instructs John to write these things because they're important, they're faithful and true. And then uh, we want to understand what it means to us, us believers, okay? Obviously, we can understand what it means to unbelievers as well because there's dire warnings in here for unbelievers, but understand what it means to us. And it means that th this is what God has promised us if, we're, if we have truly trusted him and we are faithful in demonstrating our faith in him. You know, we, as James says, we cannot show our works, I mean our faith rather, without works, good works. We demonstrate our faith by being faithful and obedient to God. So it is really a, a promise to those of us who are faithful, who have trusted God with our eternal life, with our eternity and are faithful to him. And, and our challenge, of course, is to do just that, continue to be faithful and to trust him and to and to look forward to, uh, not to say that we're to, again, rest on our laurels, but look forward to an active, uh, while we actively work uh, to glorify God in this, in this world through our works and our proclamation of the gospel, uh, we are to uh, anticipate with joy what is left set before us beyond this life under the sun so as i said our first division in the faith pathway adult quarterly is entitled an eternal renewal and from the niv i'll read from the niv uh verses chapter 21 verses 1 to 4 it reads then i saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, from God prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And verse 4, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, nor mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things are passed away. So let's back up to verse 1. This is our custom. We want to do some verse-by-verse verse expositing. And it reads, and uh, I'm going to go back and forth between the King James and the New International Version, I'm afraid. But we're going to look at part A. It says, of verse 1, it says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And as we just read in the latter part of chapter 20, uh, they fled away. Uh, and uh, Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3, verses 5 to 7 and verse 10, how the, the earth is going to melt with fervent heat. Uh, so the former heaven and the former earth have, have been uh dissolved have passed away they were not intended to be the permanent dwelling for god along with his people and the second part of that verse is and it says and there was no more sea now um we know or we probably should know that three quarters of the earth now is now covered with water with seas and we know the seas can be very violent and threatening, uh, and they also separate the people uh, in this world. Uh, and they will be done away with. There's, there will not be uh, anything threatened of the violence of the sea that we experience today, and there won't be the separation of continents, of civilizations uh, around the world because of this uh, again, some three quarters of the earth is covered by water and by the deep. So this 
symbolizes the absence, the fact that there'll be no more seas, the absence of the chaos and the horror of, again, the deep. Verse 2. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Now, the city holy city new jerusalem is coming down which means it already exists it pre-exists it's coming down from where god is where god uh, abodes to this uh, new earth okay that god has it says from god out of heaven and it says, prepare as a bride. Let me back up. It says a holy city. Now we know reference has been, or the, the Jerusalem has been referred to as holy for millennia, but it has not always been holy. Uh, it's been that because God made that the place where he would meet with his people, the place where they were to come to worship. But we know some awful unholy things over the millennia have been done in Jerusalem. However, now it's a new Jerusalem and it is holy. It's perfectly holy. There's nothing in it or will be nothing in it that's offensive to God, that is sinful or that is offensive to God. And, and, it, and it's, it's, it's actually compared to a bride, a pure bride that is dressed or adorned, beautifully adorned for her husband, the bridegroom, which is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we, we get a further description of Jerusalem uh, between verses 10 of this chapter and the end of the chapter. Uh, we, 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 we um, get the Lord uh, or his angel describes uh, the gates, the 12 gates and the angels at the gates and the, 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 the composition of the gates of material, the pearls and the foundations of different jewels. And he gets into quite uh, an expl or description of the holy city itself. But in, in this passage, it's just addressed as a beautifully adorned and bejeweled, if you will, bride. But further description of Jerusalem, even the dimensions are given later. Uh, of it uh, in uh, uh, the balance of this chapter. Verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Now, uh, this is... Uh, this is a monumental occurrence, okay? We have been the people of God, those of us who've trusted in him as long as we have trusted in him. And there have been saints uh, since, uh, since before Christ. But uh, now we will be in the very presence of our Lord. We've had a spiritual relationship with him uh, all of our saved lives. But we will be in we will be in a common dwelling place, aboding or living with uh, our God and our Savior Jesus Christ uh, in the same uh, household, if you will. We will certainly be His people, and only those in this new Jerusalem will be His people, and certainly He will be our God. He will be. Uh, our one and only, our Savior, our, our omnipotent God. Now, this, this verse says the voice comes from the throne, but it, it, it's believed that this is an angel speaking and not God himself. Later, we'll see direct pronouncements from God coming from the throne, but it is believed this is an angel speaking. So, the... the a takeaway from this verse is uh, we, we need to understand that this will be a time when when everything that currently separates us from God will be removed and we will be in perfect fellowship with God the Father. And certainly 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this brings to mind uh, a verse that we often use uh, to comfort people doing funerals. There are a couple in this uh, in this passage. First uh, Thessalonians chapter four verse seventeen, and you can look at this as being a beginning with the rapture, but it continues on as we enter into New Jerusalem. But it says, "Then we who are we who are alive and remain uh, shall be caught up." together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And then in verse 18, he tells us, therefore comfort one another with these words. So we are to comfort one another concerning their, uh, their loved ones who die in the Lord, knowing that they, as well as we will ever, will always be in the Lord. Nothing separating us from him. Let's move on to verse 4. Verse 4 reads, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things are passed away. I'd like to read that again from the King James. I use this verse a lot in trying to comfort families who have lost loved ones uh, those, of course, who died in the Lord wouldn't know how to comfort a family who lost a loved one that was not in the Lord. And it says, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. Uh, the reason I, I read that is because it comforts me. I mean, I know it. I trust it will comfort those who've lost loved ones and they know or believe uh, that their loved one knew the Lord and went to be, a spirit, his, his or her spirit went into the presence of the Lord uh, as it departed this, their bodies. Uh, but it, the, the promise of this, and this is faithful and true, this is a promise of what things will be like or how, uh, when we are in, in beyond this life, when we are in the etern eternal phase of life, no more pain, no more suffering, no more. Uh, we we can be very frustrated and anguished in anguish and disappointment uh, in this life, uh, which is full of lies, which is full of uh, all kinds of of uh, debaucheries and. Uh, it's a sin-sick and dying world, and it can be very frustrating and difficult for Christians to live in this life. Uh, however, all of that's going to be passed away. Physical pain, uh, spiritual, as I said, anguish and torment, crying, all that's going to be wiped away because, again, the former things or the old order of things, as the NIV says, will be passed away or have been passed away, or I should say have passed away. And one of the commentators, the standard commentary, says this is one of the greatest promises in the Bible, a verse that we can hold dearly. And he compares it to other verses like Isaiah 25, 8, Isaiah 35, 10, 65, 19, and Revelation 7, 17. Life brings us sorrow sometimes unrelentingly, but this promise, this is a promise that we will be removed from this, uh, this torment uh, in this uh, uh, this blessed uh, city, holy city in the very presence of God. Now, some might say, well, you know, how can, how can this be? You know, we know in this world, we're not, Christians are not immune uh, to, uh, to, the, to, to, to pain and tears and, and, and the emotional body blows that we suffer. Uh, but, is our memory going to be taken away? Is our memory of uh, how we suffered here on earth going to be taken? I have to believe yes. I mean, we're not going to remember the pain and the anguish of this world uh, because it says all those things, the former order of things, shall be taken away. So we're going to be in perfect peace uh, and we're going to have no more pain or sorrow or crying. That means we're not going to remember that caused us pain and sorrow. So now we're going to move into the second division of um, the lesson, 
which is again entitled uh, Contrasting Destinies. Contrasting Destinies, and that's covered between uh, Revelation 21 verses 5 to 9. And again, from the uh, NIV, we will read the passage and then have some verse by verse discussion. And it reads He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Verse 7. Those who are victorious will inherit all this and I will be their God and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderer, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and, the li and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake burning with sulfur. This is the second death. Verse 9. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will sh show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Okay, so let's back up to verse 5. And again, it reads... He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. King James says, faithful and true. And who is he that is sitting on the throne? Well, that has to be God. God himself now is speaking to John, the apostle John. And he is, uh, he is saying that he is making everything new, a new heaven and a new earth. And this is a great promise. Everything that John uh, and other Christians of his day are experiencing, including martyrdom, uh, they're being persecuted by the Jews and by the Romans, uh, everything, all those things will be uh, have passed away and the Lord is promising that he's making everything new and he's telling it John to write these things down because of their importance and 12 times in Revelation John is instructed to write these things down uh, not just uh, for uh, the churches the seven churches in uh, in Asia Minor but also for us okay for all the believers that would come after uh, that age uh, and we and we are beneficiaries of that because we we have these precious promises preserved because John was obedient to write them down because they were faithful and true and faithful and true as spoken by God. I mean that seems like an oxymoron. If God speaks them, certainly whatever He speaks is faithful and true, or as the NIV says, trustworthy and true. We can trust His word with our eternal lives. Uh, let alone these physical lives, but our eternal destinies. Verse 6, he said to me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the one I will, to the one, to the thirsty rather, I will give water without cost from the spring of, water, of the water of life. Now, God pronounces what he is promising to do that is make all things new heaven and earth as done okay and he's the only one that can, that can pronounce something that has not yet occurred done as though it had been done now you know there are faithful men and faithful women uh, trustworthy as trustworthy as they can humanly be and they can make promises I mean we probably have all made promises to our children or in my case, grandchildren, uh, and for whatever reason, we were not able to keep the promise or keep it exactly uh, as we promised it on the exact date or time because 
we are not in control of all circumstances. As well-meaning as we may have been and as honest as we are, we, sir, we are not in control of all circumstances. We could get ill. We could drop dead. Anything could happen. But this, is, this faithful and true statement or these statements are coming from the one that is in control of all circumstances, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning of all things and the ending of all things. And so when he says something is done, if he says something that is going to happen is done, it is as good as done. And for those of you not familiar, I'm sure by now, if you read your Bible, you know that Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. They are uh, synonymous with the A and Z in the English alphabet, the beginning and the end, the ending of everything. God is the creator of everything, and we know he is the sustainer of everything. And he is the fulfillment of everything. One of the commentators says he is the source and the goal. And, and I, I've, I've made mention of this in a recent Bible study. God is not a resource. He is the source. A resource can run out. Uh, but God is the source. He is the source of life. He is the source of all things. And he is, again, the fulfillment of of everything. A lot of the Old Testament prophecies uh, had <clears throat> intermediate fulfillings, but the ultimate fulfillment uh, of, for example, the promise uh, of God to Abraham that all the nations of the earth uh, would be blessed through him. Well, you could say, well, maybe that was the word, the word that God uh, gave the Bible, Holy Scripture, and yes, the entire world should have been blessed by the word of God, but the ultimate fulfillment was the Lord laying down his life, uh, sacrificing his life for the sins of the entire world. That's a blessing for the entire world. The second part of that verse, uh, he says, I will give to him, to the thirsty, from the fountain of the water of life freely. And and what is, what is he talking about here? Okay, he is uh, talking about this water of life, and we know that water sustains the physical life we know that water is uh, uh, symbolizes the Holy Spirit who is of course uh, God the, the Holy Spirit and the source of life and and of course our our comforter our guide and truth and, uh, and and the one who empowers us and enables us to walk circumspectly before God uh, but he is talking about this Water, he's talking, living water, he's talking about is eternal life. You remember uh, when the Lord Jesus met the woman at the well? Uh, John chapter 4, verses, verses 10 to 14. You know, he talked about giving her living water. If she knew who he was, she would, he would give her living water and she would not thirst again. Well, he was talking spiritually about eternal life uh, and uh uh, that is what is being referred to here. And he said to those who are thirsty, in other words, you have to recognize your spiritual need, your spiritual bankruptcy to seek uh, the spiritual life that the Lord Jesus offered us, uh, that the Lord Jesus offered when he, when he was here on earth. And actually, as his word offers us today, you have to have a hunger and a thirst uh, for uh, the the what what is beyond your ability to attain for yourself, and that is spiritual eternal life. And he's finally he's offered to give that freely. It cost us nothing but faith, but faith to believe what Jesus did on the cross uh, for our to, to bear our sins. What he did on the cross. Uh, in our place, uh, all we have to do is to believe that free gift, and we have uh, the, the salvation that uh, that the Lord bought us. Now it's it's free free to us, but it cost Him dearly. So 
we, we, we know that there will be no spiritual thirst uh, that will go unquenched in the new heaven and earth. In fact, there should not be any spiritual thirst there uh, because of what the Lord Jesus, what the Lamb did, uh, and, uh, and all residents, of course, will be in close fellowship with, in close um, fellowship with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in this new Jerusalem. Let's move on to verse 7. And verse 7 reads, Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Again, this is God speaking from the throne. Uh, the King James says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. Whether, whether it's overcometh or victorious, what are we talking about? First of all, those who place their trust in the Lord Jesus, in the salvation that Jesus bought us, purchased for us on the cross. That is first. And then being victorious over the sin in this life. It does not mean that we're going to walk in sinless perfection from the time that we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But it means that the, the habit of our life, the direction of our life is to be more and more obedient, more and more faithful to God in keeping his word, in sharing the gospel, in sharing the salvation, the, the good news of the salvation that God has freely given us, okay, and in walking circumspectly before him. Uh, and and we know the Bible says the steps of a good man are, are ordered of the Lord. Though he stumbles, he will not be utterly cast down. Now, this word overcometh or victorious, um, as the NIV renders it, comes from the Greek Nike. Nike, and we know there's a there's a popular sports uh, brand or trademark uh, for athletic apparel by that name. But it, it really means to, uh, to be, uh, to conquer or to be victorious. And in our Christian walk, it means to be victorious over sin or to conquer sin in our daily lives. And we don't do that in our own strength. We do that by the power of the Holy Spirit who indwells us and who enables us to resist sin and to be victorious over sin. And he says he is going to be his God, or that person's God, the one that is victorious, and they are going to be his children. Now, uh, again, as I said, John, uh, not John, but James uh, asked the rhetorical question, you know, show me your faith uh, without works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Now, we're not talking about uh, <clears throat> uh, being legalistic, uh, or thinking that God is keeping score uh, of the times we go to church and the times we go to Sunday school and the times we go to Bible study. No, it, it, what he is saying that, that, that those who are attempting every day to walk in the Spirit or by the enablement of the Spirit uh, uh, are, are the overcomers. Uh, those are the ones that uh, have hidden the word in their hearts that they might not sin against God. And as I said, does not mean that you're not going to stumble occasionally. None of us are walking in sinless perfection, uh, perfection. But if we're trusting God and leaning on the Holy Spirit, trusting him to get us through times of temptation or times of trial, uh, this is the, vict the victory that we're talking about here in the Christian living abiding in him in the vine uh, as uh, the Lord says in John 15 and we will produce much fruit if we abide in him let's move on to verse 8 verse 8 reads but the cowardly the unbelieving the vile the murderer the sexually immoral those who practice magic arts the idolaters and liars they will be consigned to the fiery lake burning with sulfur this is the second death. Now, we're not going to get into those specific uh, 
sins, and, and but, but let me just say uh, they generally characterize uh, those who are living uh, lives that are uh, in <clears throat> rejection of God, in opposition to the will of God. And we're not talking about people who do these things, uh, have done these things on occasion, uh, and certainly that's uh, not good for any Christian to do, but these who have done these things as lifestyles, these who uh, have practiced lying and practiced uh, whoremongering and practiced uh, sorceries uh, and practiced uh, all of these uh, abominations and these sins that are listed here as lifestyles. They have clearly rejected uh, God. And, and again, uh, you, you, I mean, not again, but you guys have heard of the unpardonable sin, uh, and, and there's been some confusion about what that is. The only unpardonable sin is the rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the rejection of the Holy Spirit, drawing us to faith in Jesus Christ. Life for a lifetime. Uh, we know that the thief on the cross did it at the moment of death, at the moment of his crucifixion. He trusted in God and he called out to him. Remember me when you enter into your kingdom and the Lord saved him at that moment. So he's saying all those who live lives uh, that are openly in rejection or in rejection uh, of God, uh, those who have rejected the faith, I mean, sorry, the salvation that he has offered them freely will be consigned or thrown into the lake of fire, which burns with sulfur or which forever and ever, right along with the, the devil. And I should add, before we move into to the final verse, that this uh, this list includes uh, <clears throat> uh, false uh, believers or imposters that are in the church. You know, and they're spoken of many places uh, in the New Testament: Second Corinthians eleven thirteen, Galatians chapter two verse four, Second Peter two. Verse 1 and Jude 4, Revelations 2, 2. So they're imposters and believing themselves. You know, Matthew chapter 7, uh, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, you know, that there are going to be some that come to him in the last day saying, Lord, Lord, haven't we done this and haven't we done that? And he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. So there are some that are self-deceived and there are some that are just deceiving others as far as their relationship with Christ is concerned. They are imposters, and they've been sitting in the church for whatever reason, perhaps for decades, uh, in an unsaved condition. So finally, verse 9 says, One of the seven angels had the seven bowls of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. So, and that is a prelude to further a further and more detailed description of the New Jerusalem. Uh, again, it, it's called the wife because it contains the believers, the true believers, uh, not the city in of itself, but the, those who dwell in that city, who will dwell with God, who will, who are, are his people, and he is their God. It is talking about the people, not just the bejeweled city. Uh, and again, in uh, the balance of chapter 21, the angel goes into further description of the city. And I, I trust you will read that. So I hope we are, um, that our faith is strengthened by, uh, this reminder. I know we've read uh, perhaps uh, this passage before. Uh, we want to be encouraged and we want our faith in what lies ahead for us beyond this life. And many of us, not all, but many of us have many, many more years behind us than we have before us. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, my mother, my brother, and, 
and so many other saints that have gone before that are that will be in this beautiful place in the presence of the living God for eternity throughout eternities. So Father, we again thank you for um, Lord your precious word. We thank you for your promises, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for shedding your precious blood um, to wash our sins away as far as the east is from the west. And Lord, as we trusted you, we entrusted you, we trusted that you've done just that, Lord. Uh, we look forward, Lord, to that day when we will be in your very presence, Lord. Uh, nothing separating us, Lord. We look forward to that day of joy and peace when there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more crying. We look for, for the former things will have passed away. Lord, let those who have heard this lesson be strengthened uh, and be encouraged uh, and by uh, what you have promised to do, which we know is faithful and very true, Lord, and we know you being Alpha and Omega, it is done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.